so uh, we prepared in uh, so uh, first of all uh, to our to the two of us, uh, we uh, somehow stumbled upon each other uh, while we started studying physics in Munich. And this is very much the character of the talk. So we are talking with utter competence, uh, other than we saw some formulas once in university. So uh, please take it with a huge grain of salt and don't try anything of this at home. Uh, or if you do, write a paper about it and uh, Please cite us, we badly need that and stuff like that. <laughs> so, um, the, t the, the talk was prepared in German. Uh, this was our, uh, uh, our um, lack of foresight or uh, insight into the, into the FAR plan. Nobody looks at that, right? Uh, especially if you're planning to do a talk. And uh, the, ta the, 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 the slides will be in German, but we will do our best to try and translate it. Uh, Everything else, uh, well, uh, you can try. And I mean, it's not that complicated. Uh, numbers are international, I've heard. Um, so it's about uh, what happens when the subwoofer inhales the cat. And we de deliberately chose the German word for subwoofer uh, to make it more on point. Um, first of all, uh, we will start with, by, with a quote from a famous uh, Austrian composer. Uh, unfortunately, he did not uh, supply waffles to events he visited. Um, uh, only when the subwoofer inhales the cat, uh, you know that the bass fucks. Um, and uh, this is attributed to him, but uh, as we know famously from uh, Abe Lincoln, don't trust anything you read on the internet. Um, so we shall start. Um, first of all, we have to assume a point like cat in a vacuum. Oh. Um, no, v vacuums don't work with subwoofers. OK, let's screw the vacuum. Yeah. Uh, so point like cat? Uh, if the cat needs to be accelerated by airflow, then it needs some surface area. Can we compromise on spherical? Spherical cats. Okay, spherical cats it is. Uh, so we have spherical cats in a vacuum, so this is our experimental setup. Um, uh, don't mind my awesome uh, GIMP skills in uh, cutting out whatever uh, 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 this AI generator did. Uh, you see uh, elite uh, GIMP skills uh, that you see all over the internet. Um, so yeah, this is our experimental setup. So we have a subwoofer and a cat that we assume to be a sphere of uh, 6.5 centimeters in diameter. Uh, that's uh, three... Uh, radius. Uh, ra yeah, radius. Uh, no, diameter, no? No, radius. Uh, whatever, it's, it's just an, uh, half an order of magnitude, who cares. Um, and um, this, for, for the people who don't know metric, this is uh, roughly uh, three waffles and one chunk or something like that. Um, so first, n now we have to uh, dump some formulas on you. I will give that to you. Okay. So now uh, these formulas are obviously very complicated. Uh, these formulas are obviously very complicated, and no one has ever seen those. Um, well, that's cool, at least. No, not. Uh, so at first we are, uh, have to calculate the velocity, uh, average velocity, um, with which the cat is sucked into the. Um, subwoofer and what uh, acceleration results from that. So we have here the known formula V is x by uh, time and uh, acceleration one half x by t squared. So um, we are assuming that our cat uh, is moved by um, a distance of uh, 50 centimeters and um, this happens during the time of uh, half a frequency. Half a period. Half a period, yeah. So, now we uh, make some assumptions, uh, starting with a uh, frequency of uh, 10 hertz. Um, we uh, calculate our acceleration, uh, which uh, then comes out to uh, about 100 meters uh, per second squared, so that's already a, that's already a 10 g. So, usually, a cat would not survive that. I think uh, the g does not stand for goulash in this case. 
No, not collage of uh, accelerations. Um, to be thorough, we uh, obviously also wanted to have a um, more realistic uh, calculation. Subwoofers usually don't go as low as uh, 10 hertz. 20 is more realistic. And then we unfortunately end up with 40 Gs of force on the cat. We already know that cats are liquid, but this one definitely is. Now, uh, what uh, velocities of air do we need to accelerate a cat that fast? You can uh, calculate this with the uh, obviously known formula for uh, the dr the, the drag, drag force. for the drag force, um, which is the uh, um, surface area of the cat uh, times the certain value, the C uh, W value. Uh, adjust the note. Uh, this formula has been banned in Florida, just for the record. Fair. <laughs> you know Florida, man. <laughs> um, so the, uh, times the uh, density of uh, the air and times the velocity squared. Now, um, plugging in all our uh, totally realistic numbers, um, we get a, a velocity of about 330 meters per second uh, of airflow uh, for the 10 hertz case or um, 660 uh, for the 20 hertz case. To um, those who don't know, 340 48 is the speed of sound. So we would need a f airflow faster than the speed of sound <laughs> to get, which is not possible. possible. Uh, but so uh, just uh, to make sure, uh, theoretically, during the preparation of this talk, no cats were harmed. And um, we had uh, a message, uh, we had a message from uh, one other guy, some I think his, for, his name is Ervin, yeah. and he said he didn't, he didn't like this. Not like this <laughs> uh, because now he knows what happens with a cat. So, uh, long story short, if you have a cat at home and a subwoofer, please make sure the subwoofer doesn't inhale the cat, because then the only thing that is fucked is the cat. Um, okay, then, uh, thank you very much, and uh, enjoy the GPN. Läuft. So, oh, so many people, it would, so, would be so bad if something would, would go wrong. Uh, anyhow, um, hi, I'm Janis, and I will show you something about destroying data uh, with style um, or how live uh, H. Oh. oh, dang it. D don't you hate it when your HDMI goes out of tune? Um, nah. Oh well, <laughs> wrong channel. Bear, bear with me. Bear with me. Uh, maybe the batteries are hot. I don't know. It's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a rocket launch now. Um, bear with me. Bear with me. Uh, Ah, there we go. Okay, I, th I think I've got it. Uh, it's a bit of a tune, but... Ah, okay, I've, I've got it. Um, what you've just seen was um, obviously not, not a fault by my HDMI, but uh, a sample of data moshing. Um, oh, by the way, data moshing um, is an art form um, in which you create a visually appealing videos or image data by deliberately destroying it. So, um, to understand how data moshing works, or 
data motion with H.264 specifically, um, we first need to understand how H.264 compression works, basically. So it's a form of lossy video compression. And um, basically, as if you look, watch a video or a movie um, with a set scene, um, you can observe that mostly the scene is quite constant. So if you look at every frame of your scene, there are small, only small differences. So it would be nonsense to store every frame by, by itself. It would just use up a lot of data. Um, uh, but to compress this data, some clever people develop algorithms to uh, use these properties. And to th this observation that motion data um, is different between, or, nah. I'm sorry, I've, I've prepared my talk in German, so I might have to translate my stuff in the head, but um, basically, in the sample you can see there's the Pac-Man with these three dots. He wants to eat those three dots, and we see those different frames. And we can observe between those two frames only the dots are moved. So the H264 H compression things are all right. Only those dots move, we just need to store the motion information that these three dots have been moved by a certain amount of pixels between those two frames. And this is quite clever because it, it quite fits the, the data um, well, which we can typically see in movies. Um, but if we, well, mess with that, um, we can create some funny effects. Um, those frames which are referencing an iframe, we, we call frames which contain the full image iframes, and frames with a delta to that frame, P frames. There are also B frames which can reference both P frames and the next iframe in the future, but we don't care about them, they're just destroying everything, they're bad. So we, we throw them out as well, and if we now deliberately do a scene change without the iframe in the middle, we can observe some funny effects. For example, you have here this scene, and we've removed iframes and just put another video next to it, and then we get this funny morph effect. Um, so to do that um, efficiently uh, in our tool, we... Um, need to do some preparations. At first, we need to throw out, throw out all those um, B frames because, well, they, they suck forward references and we need to renumber them and that's bad. So we throw them out. We do this by setting B frames uh, equal zero in this super simple FFmpeg command. Um, we all love those. Um, great. Um, and also we try to reduce the number of I frames to, like, to a minimum. Um, we use it with the screen uh, command, which um, basically tells the FFmpeg or the, the, X, uh, lib, uh, the, the H.264 uh, encoder to uh, assume that the whole video is one scene. Okay, and we also like want to keep the resolution constant and the frame rate constant, and now we can have fun with that. Um, we build a tool which allows us to control that live. Um, what, sh the, what this tool basically does is iterates through an H.264 videos, separates them frame by frames, and we pass the frame type, like iframe, is it an iframe or is it a P frame? And then we can mess with the data. We can drop iframes, we can skip frames, and then we just need to make it controllable. We've built like a, a small US OSC interface for that. Um, we can use the iPad to control the glitchiness of um, our video, and we can attach, for example, beat and beat input to that and change the videos. So uh, today we have another slot at the launch, um, starting at uh, 7:45. And yeah, happy to see you there. And maybe some glitching. Oh, there's also the, the project is under this coders dot io dot, dot com is wrong. I don't know what happened there. It's this coders dot io. <laughs> I don't know what happened there. But yeah, thank you and um, 
Happy glitching. Firewall out of duct tape. Kommst du klar? Ah, du machst ähm, fünf Minuten, ne? Okay, dann go. Oh, hello everybody. Um, I want to tell you a bit about web application firewalls or one in specific, um, which is just another layer of duct type trying to fix web security. Um, because I did this um, as part of my work there, you can also find our uh, small little logo and link up there. Um, well, let's start with the question, what is a WAF? Well, it's a simple device which just tries to answer the a question for H every HTTP request. Well, is it malicious? Um, if no, then forward it to the web application. Otherwise, um, report an error or do some logging or do some intrusion detection or whatever fun you can imagine. Um, Oh well, things got broken. Um, so there is this funny little question, is it malicious? Hard question. How do we answer it? Well, we use other people's work because uh, the fancy uh, people from OWASP uh, already did this work and they did a pretty neat job about it, um, which is called the OWASP Mod Security Core Rule Set. Um, so next question. What is this funny OWASP Coral set? It's a Coral set for mod security. Well, uh, helps much not. Um, mod security is a, a plugin uh, which is uh, which was originally built for Apache, um, uh, but can also be compiled against Nginx. Um, the problem is it's included in Nginx Plus, but if you uh, want it with the, your everyday um, open source Nginx, you have to compile it yourself. Uh, we come to back to this a bit later, or why this could be a problem, but in theory it works. Well, it's a framework of uh, production tested filter rules, which make it very easy to just uh, deploy a sort of um, web application for, uh, firewall, which answers this um, funny little question from the slide before, um, automatically for you. So how do you use it? Um, well, for uh, most, Use cases just use paranoia level one. Um, that's the default. Um, it tries to um, just work with your everyday application. If you have fancy fields, something like a password, you may be need. Um, uh, yeah, some. Um, specifier to not uh, check the password field um, if you want your users to provide passwords like um, exec, bin bash, or something like this. If you want this as a password, then probably you want to change something. Uh, normally, you don't need to change things. So, can I help you to set it up? Well, yes. Um, this is an Ansible, the link to my to a GitHub page um, where you can find a Ansible playbook. Wait, I can show it. Um, this is this um, um, yeah playbook uh, or role. Actually, it's a role uh, we developed. Um, it's part of the thing. Um, some of you know public money, so I'm get I get paid by the state. You saw it in the logo. So we make we try to make some public code. Um, you can find it here. Um, it's tested for um, Red Hat and. Um, Debian-based system, so there are also Fedora and CentOS works. Um, you install it with Ansible Galaxy, and um, yeah, 
then you can just uh, set a playbook which has five lines and that will deploy an Apache web server. Because of this um, neat little problem, um, I can write an Ansible playbook which compiles your um, engine X, but you probably don't want to use that in production. So we just um, use Apache. I hope uh, most of you find that somewhat helpful. Um, this thing just deploys an Apache, sets up the uh, web application firewall, does pretty much everything for you. Um, yeah, then you have an uh, installed web server with a web application firewall and you can deploy your web application or do whatever. Thank you. Thank you. Hardening electronics. Um, protecting computers from cosmic rays. So. Und dann nimm das Mikrofon dann auch schön, schön nah. Jo, es läuft und go. Well, that's of course, that was to be expected. Uh, can I exchange it? Well, that's perfect. <laughs> Typical. Uh, um, okay, so let me see if I can change the mode and then extend to right, present again and you better be right. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. Okay, yeah, close enough. So, failure is not an option. Uh, today I want to talk about an important concept. <laughs> oh, for fuck's sake. Okay, I mean, I'm not swearing. Um, yeah, so today I want to talk about an important concept in computing, especially when you want things, okay, especially if you want things to work reliably uh, much above the typical failure rates that you'd have for individual components. And of course, this is especially important for um, aerospace, where things may not go wrong. But it's also used in cars and medical equipment and all kinds of other things. Um, some menu on my screen is not going away. Okay, that's typical for a HackerCon. Okay, so yeah, just a quick anecdote, um, which I found quite interesting and which showcases where some of these errors might come from, especially for spacecraft. Um, Intel was working on some of their new memory in the late 70s, and they were reducing the process size, and they were trying to get more and more RAM onto one silicon die. And then they started encountering issues, and they knew all of the typical ones. They knew that some of the issues in their production could cause that, but they actually had them all ironed out. They weren't a problem anymore. But still, some of the bits would start flipping. Um, and it turned out that there were nuclear isotopes in the IC packages, especially in the ceramics, which likes to hold on to polonium and uranium and things like that. And the alpha particles, so charged ionizing radiation that it emitted, would trigger the cells to flip. They would cause some of the electrons to release from the silicon mesh and uh, activate the cell. And you didn't want that. That was a big issue and it was a pretty big find when when they figured it out back then. And it's the same thing that is the main challenge when you're designing a computer for use in space. That was the motivating example, but these kinds of bit flip issues, systems failing and having a limited reliability, they apply to spacecraft, but also to all kinds of equipment. There was a case of Toyotas, I believe in the early 2000s, where cosmic radiation, so not radiation in the packaging, but also ionizing radiation from another source caused cars to no longer be able to brake. The acceleration would just continue and continue and continue and many people died due to that. So now cars also implement these principles. Yeah, uh, a typical margin of error you would have for a computer if you're really trying to make it reliable is that it fails every 10 million hours. We can't really do much better than that um, unless you're doing some very special things, but a standard processor won't give you more reliability than that, and it's just not good enough. So what do we do? Triple modular redundancy. That's the magic word, or three magic words. And the idea is, I think that's a little stretched, doesn't matter. Um, 
You take one computer, it can fail, it can go wrong. Uh, so, you take a few more. Now you have a few computers, and even if one of them fails, the other two will very likely be working correctly, because the fact that the chance that two fail at once is just hugely unlikely. You have to figure out which one of the results is correct. So you use a voter, um, a majority voter, and it says, okay, well, these two the results are identical, and the other one isn't, so that one has to be wrong. And that works. But your voter typically only has the same limit of reliability. So if that fails, well, you have a, you have a bottleneck. You have a weakest link in your system. It doesn't work. The solution's not sufficient. But you can also triple the voters. So now, when one of the voters fails, the other two are still working correctly, and you have three correctly working computers. So now you have two correct solutions coming from the voter and one incorrect solution. I mean, we're a little closer, but that still doesn't help us, because who decides which one of these three results is correct? Again, you would need a single component. But, of course, everything is spoilered here at the top right. And what you can do is you run the three computers over the three results, and now one of the computers can only give you an incorrect value because it's working off incorrect information. But with the voter step that follows it, you have actually managed to completely work around this failure in one of the lanes. They're, they're called lanes, typically, in uh, this field. Yep, okay, so I'm done. It applies to everything in the system. Sensors, buses, actuators. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> wow, excellent. Um, that's quite tricky, that topic. Um, Excel. Programming in Excel. No, I'm sorry, I'm just trolling. Okay. Here's the... So, I want to show you now a spreadsheet I made with what you can create code. You can create code so it works on... So you have the predefined operations and then you can combine these operations and you only need to mention the operation and the, the variables of the operations and then you can combine it. And it's also the feature to, for example, the first two lines this is here. These are together, then it is also possible to combine two lines, currently two lines of input together to one line of output. It's for variables important to assign something to a variable for that. It's important and yeah, and it works based on how I hope I can navigate to another. So yeah, and here there you can see the definition. So here there's for each for each operation you need to define how many rows you have, and then you can then you can create code with it. Yeah, and, and I think it's relatively simple. So you need to specify how many rows of input you have to generate these operations, and you need to tell how many variables are in this, and then with these two. Informations and what's the content, what you can see in column H and I, then you can create through that the function. Yeah. And if you are more interested, you can talk to me, then I can explain it a bit more afterwards. Thank you very much. <laughs> then Blender, introduction to Blender. Please come forward. Um, do we have USB here or VGA? Because that's all I've got, sadly. Um, okay. Du, 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 du. Das ist nicht. Warte mal, auf der anderen Seite ist hier noch diese, diese Dingsy. Um, du hast um, VGA. Das ist ein sehr alter Thinkpad, so. Das ist alles gut. In der Hoffnung, dass wir das hier haben. Ich 
dann, ähm, ich, ja. keine Ahnung, ob, kannst du umschalten auf, auf einen anderen Monitor? Ähm, nee, irgendwie. Du hast Ahnung? Okay. Ähm, wobei alles gut, sonst gebe ich den Talk alles okay. Ähm, hier, guck mal, hier ist. Achso, nee, das ist. Ich dachte, das sei hier Beamer. Ah, nee, um die, die andere Geschmacksrichtung. Äh, Computer hat VGA und. Hm, das ist falsch rum. Nee, sorry. Okay, nee, alles Manchmal gut. muss man den Rechner neu starten, wenn das VGA eingestellt worden ist. Oh, das klappt das. Überschreitet die fünf Minuten. Aber naja. Okay. okay cool. Trotzdem danke. Du kannst es mir brauchen, dann kannst du meinen Laptop benutzen zu präsentieren, wenn du meinst. Äh, dann brauchst du es, bräuchte ich nur einen Browser. Sehr gerne. Ja. Hm? Ja, cool. Dann machen wir das. Ja, cool. Dann danke schon mal. Ja. Hast du die Uhr? Ähm, ja. Genau. Und das ist dann das Mikro. Ja, die Beutels Keyboard ist okay, hoffentlich. I hope so. Okay. If you can't type, then I type for you, uh, because it's maybe Leo. Slash Blender dot HTML. Okay, so the slides are online. Just copy this if you want to see them. Okay, thanks. I guess five minutes are running. Okay, so hi and welcome to um, a short introduction to Blender. Um, in the next four and a half minutes, um, I will be talking about what is Blender, what can it be used for, and how can you use it in your free time if you want to. Um, I'm sorry, the slides are in German and I'm uh, translating on the fly, so <laughs> yes. Let's see about that. Also, thank you very much for lending me your uh, ThinkPad. Okay, so what is Blender? Um, Blender is a 3D software and it can do everything except um, ironing your clothes, as my mom would say. Um, you can uh, model some 3D models, of course, and do everything fun that you can do with 3D models. Like you can export them in every file imaginable. You can use them for game assets if you're programming a video game. You can also animate them and uh, do some short little fun video clips like you can see on the pictures there. And I've also got some film tips later on if the five minutes are long enough. And yes, of course, if you are into 3D printing and can't find something on Thingiverse, just open up Blender and do it on your own and just export it and you're ready to print. So what else can you do? Um, you can also animate not only in 3D but also in 2D if you're more into drawing stuff and drawing uh, a lot of frames because you will need a lot of frames, uh, frames if you're doing a short film. And you can also do some special effects like, it, like you can see on the uh, right below picture. And this is a, a film frame taken from an official Blender film. Um, yes, what you can also do, but there are other, so other softwares out there that are better for this use case are um, cutting videos. You can do this in Blender, but there's better software out there. And CAD, if you need something, uh, some mechanical pens, mechanical uh, parts with exact measurements, maybe use a uh, dedicated CAD program instead of Blender, but otherwise you're fine. It's okay. Let's go on to the Let's go on to the promised film tips. If I can hit the button. 
Okay, so um, talking about Blender, you also might want to know about the Blender Foundation because um, they are publishing a new film about every new year. Um, there are three examples on the right. <coughs> And if you're tired of Netflix and Amazon Prime, just go have a look at studio.blender.org slash films. They have lots of great films out there and they even provide some materials and some assets if you are trying to make your own film. So, okay, thank you for listening and go download Blender. It's free, it's open source and have fun. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Then, SSH for your apps. SSH keys. SSH keys. I actually had a different talk prepared, but my battery is dead, and that one needs to be done. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you for the talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. 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 Thank you Yes, do not use passwords. Passwords suck. And um, okay, who set up an HTTPS website? There's still a lot of people. Uh, and there's a there's a difference between SSH security and uh, HTTPS security. What is the difference? One major difference is that no one logs in using client keys to a website. Right? Well, almost. It, it's pretty much not supported, but uh, for SSH, the situation is completely different. You already have the keys, and you already know how to use it. The security model is kind of obvious, so if I want to set up a secure service, would I use a TLS, which is used for HTTPS, or would I use SSH? SSH? I already have the SSH keys. All my friends have them. Like, I mean, why not? Uh, and uh, yeah, if you want to do the same with uh, HTTPS, then you would have to use something like pass keys or, or, or th and this is complicated. I don't want it. I want my application to be simple. So I asked myself the question, is it possible to reuse my SSH keys in my custom application based on TLS? The answer is yes. Actually, it's possible. And uh, I built a key converter f to, to test this, uh, and it actually works. Uh, I built it, of course, in Rust, because Rust is cool. And uh, so why is it even possible? This, possible? this is possible because they are both using the same encryption. They use the same, some of the same signature algorithms, uh, specifically the elliptic curve 25519. It's possible to either use the, uh, the SSH key after conversion as the base for the TLS certificate that you present as a client to log in to, to authenticate yourself to some TLS service. And yeah, uh, I did it. I even managed to make it work with an SSH agent. If you want to talk about the details, come to me or come to my website and see what other random things I do. Uh, the website is dorotac dot eu and yeah we can uh, meet up on mastodon and talk about crazy projects as well <laughs> D, D O R O T A dot e u thanks thank you <laughs> awesome without computer um, the React takes 10 minutes. Yeah, we just got six. Okay, then um, we're running out of talks. I do the other one. Hmm? Someone has the computer. I put two mine and buy it. Ah, okay, then. Just demo with. Shoot. The handy equipment. Yeah, then shoot. Um, 
Ja, den hatte ich vergessen. Typing and holding microphones probably tough. So, um, <laughs> thank you. So, lock sealing uh, is a technique to allow a system administrator to set up journal D in order that the log files after someone fully compromised the system cannot be modified without the administrator noticing. And to show you how this works, um, I'll just quickly do this. So here's a container where uh, journal D is running. And if I can write journal CTL correctly, um, you can see that it has uh, log messages. And uh, in order to get log sealing running, it's, it's enabled by default. You just need to set up keys. Use journal CTL minus minus set up keys. And uh, usually sealing happens once every 15 minutes, but we don't have 15 minutes. Then I set it to... Uh, 30 seconds. So it generates a key pair, and now um, I'm gonna rotate. Yeah, journal CTL, great. Um, so that we have a file that only contains sealed messages. And I'm just writing a message in, and journal CTL works just as before. But now I can give it the key. And uh, it tells me, yeah, okay, um, your last message here is not sealed yet because the, the time hasn't passed, but in 10 seconds, um, log sealing, when it happens every 30 seconds, it will happen once on the full minute and at 30 seconds in the minute. So uh, now it tells me the journal has been completely sealed. And cryptographically, um, I, I'll just put another message. Uh, Ah, you're, I'm standing in front of it, yeah. yes. Uh, oh. So, okay, so we have uh, journal CTL um, told me that every message has been sealed, and cryptographically it means that it has thrown away the key with which it has um, sealed the old message, so an attacker who will then compromise the system should not have the possibility um, to, to tamper with that message. Okay, and now uh, uh, the new message was sealed as well. But as I mentioned, um, we have an attack. And where is the code? Here's the code. I run the attack. And after a bit of patching around, um, verify still says everything is okay. But if I display the log, um, the last message has been changed. And um, if you want to know more about the vulnerability, we have published the demo code. Um, The patch that System D did not accept because they thought it was not a bug. Uh, and um, a bit more information on the background here. Thank you. Thank you.